Uh, hello everybody, uh, I'm Richard Southwell, it's really nice to be here, and I'm going to talk about size spectrum models as microcosms. So what does that mean? Well, a size spectrum model is a sort of marine ecosystem model where you keep track of the sizes of the different organisms. And we're interested in using those type of models uh, to make so something like a sort of microcosm, a sort of make-believe um, simulated um, ecosystem which is ready for other species to be added in so we can study the interactions between things. Um, so I want to describe these size spectrum models to you and the important idea is that big fish eat little fish and grow because of it. That's really the, um, the sort of model in a nutshell. Um, so why is it important to model size? Well, the thing is that fish grow over many orders of magnitude in their life. And if you're a fishery scientist interested in how many big fish there are, well, the very important uh, thing to know about is how many little fish were there. And when you start thinking about what happens to fish as they change size, um, the kind of usual way of thinking about food webs starts to, starts to break down a little bit. I mean... In a normal food web model, you would say, for example, that lions eat zebra and zebra don't eat lions. But in a marine ecological system, our fish grow over many orders of magnitude. And it might be that although normally at large, large members of species A usually eat large members of species B, uh, it could be that sometimes... Um, a large member of species B might eat the eggs of species A or little fledgling members of species A. So it's not quite so clear cut uh, what species eats what. It depends on what size things are. And so we're interested in modelling this and the sort of basic objects which we want to see evolve with time are these descriptions here of how many fish there are of different weights. So how many fish are there of a weight one gram? Well, almost none, right? That's why we use a sort of density function. I mean, if I ask you how many fish there are between 0 0.9 grams and 1.1 grams, um, that's a much more well-formed question. And this, this so-called abundance, this density function here, answers that question. If we find the area under this abundance curve here uh, between two weight values, that area tells us how many individuals there are between those weight values. So you sort of integrate this to find out how many fish there are between two given weight values. And this is the basic object we're interested in. We're interested in this sort of curve which tells us how many fish there are of a given species at a given time. And we want to know how it's going to evolve. But we have a sort of coupled system so we can have other species in there as well and they'll be eating one another and doing all sorts of things. And we can describe, or at least we can make a model of how this abundance will change over time. And I'm going to describe a bit more about that, the size spectrum model. So the dynamics are driven by a partial differential equation. Um, and it's a fairly complicated thing in some sense, because, well, I'll explain later, but at the core of this, sort of approach is a very simple idea and it's this idea of a sort of basic predator prey encounter so if we have a weight w predator in, which encounters say a hungry predator which encounters a weight wp prey well what's going to happen if we think about the counts of the weights of different sized fish well we're going to have one less um, of these this is going to die uh, and this predator is going to change its weight and after the interaction its weight is going to be its previous weight plus some fraction of the predator's weight. This alpha here being the fraction of the energy that can really be assimilated by the predator. Um, and so if we think about this basic interaction and we say well actually we want our growth of our fish and the death rates of our fish to be based on this and based on how many how what what sort of frequency of interactions there are between predators and prey of different sizes well we can get a a quite interesting model um of how these things how the abundance of 
different organisms change over time. Now, there are different ways to set this thing up. Um, we're using the McKendrick von Furster equation. Um, so essentially, it's a partial differential equation. It gives us a relationship between the rate of change of abundance with time and the rate of change of abundance with weight and the growth rate of the organisms and the death rate. So this would be a sort of relatively straightforward math problem if the growth rate and the death rate of particular organisms was already fixed beforehand. But the thing is, we like to make the growth rate depend. So the growth rate for a particular individual depends on how much food there is for that individual to eat. Um, and so because of that, this, this is a sort of more complicated object and it's, it's got some very interesting dynamics. Um, but okay, what's the basic idea of this? I'll try and explain this um, size spectrum model um, without using so much algebra. So this picture shows most of the effects that are going on. Um, well, we have, we're keeping track of um, the abundance at different masses. Uh, it just so happens that if you, that this, the sort of abundance curves that this system settles to look like straight lines on log log plots usually, uh, well, I should say often. Um, well, not exactly straight, but they, they tend to have large straight pieces to them. They, things tend to be power laws. Um, but ignoring that curve, the rest of the things in this picture really explain what's going on. So we would have um, predators, which would be eating individuals um, of a smaller size, and they would be growing because of them. These are sort of intermediate case. They're getting predated upon by these larger predators here. So some of these, um, the abundance would get decreased by that death effect. But also these individuals here would have a certain preference for organisms of a certain ratio of their own weight, and they would be predating upon them. And um, that will induce their growth, which will move this mass sort of further to the right in the picture. And we also have reproduction. So if we want to work out how much inflow there is of new organisms at this side, we sort of have to sum over the abundance of the mature fish. I shall explain that in more detail later. Here's a picture to try and explain how feeding preference works a bit more clearly. So basically, if we have a predator and a prey, they may be different species and we can model um, different sort of preference levels between species, but we can also model the preference, the sort of what kind of size of prey a certain predator prefers. So the thing we're implementing in our model is this idea that every species will be associated with a sort of ratio and they most prefer to eat prey whose weight is that ratio of their own weight. So in this picture here, we have a predator with, um, which is a thousand grams heavy. And uh, this log normal distribution here shows its preference for um, prey of different weights. And you see it most prefers prey of weight 10 in this case. And so when we're determining the energy, um, how do we determine the growth rate, right? Let me ex try and explain this. So basically, the important thing about growth and lots of other processes is that you need energy. So how do we work out how much energy a, a fish gets? Well, we see how many prey there are for it to eat. We weight them by the preference that the predator has for the prey. And we also take account of the fact that the predator is only going to have a limited um, searching ability and that gives us the energy encountered by the predator however a predator can't always eat all of the um, energy it encounters so we have a sort of holling type 2 functional response uh, to take account of the fact that its eating rate will be limited um, and then that gives us the sort of energy that the fish can use out of that it'll have to use some for its sort of metabolic and movement costs. 
it may want to use some for reproduction if it's a mature organism i shouldn't say one to but it it may use some for reproduction if it's mature and the remaining energy will go into growth that's how our that's how we've modeled things there's also the death which again it, I, we have sort of different reasons why an organism might die it might die because of predation could be fishing we can model fishing with different selectivity gears at different weights and so on and there could be other stuff that we could decide um, viruses or whatever um, the predation death is pretty interesting the way you work that out is pretty similar to the way you work out the growth rate you sort of when you work out the growth rate you integrate over all the prey and weight them by the preference you have to eat them to work out the predation death rate you integrate over all the predators and um, work out um, and weight them for how much preference they have to eat you so it's kind of the same thing backwards um, another important thing in the model is the plankton we use a semi-chemostat equation to model the plankton because we have to have something for the smallest fish to eat um, there is a sort of funny thing about these size spectrum models I mean um, that you if you're only going to model organisms between two size ranges you have to put some sort of assumptions about what is beyond those size ranges um, and the other thing is the reproduction and this is um, ba the basic idea is that when you have these abundance curves um, imagine those sort of changing through time as our partial differential equation evolves I mean basically I've described roughly how we get these growth rate and mortality rate and when we have those we want to sort of solve this partial differential equation and um, the solutions will look like sort of movies of those abundance curves changing with time but I haven't told you about the boundary condition um, so the basically the idea of a boundary condition is we work out how much abundance is coming in at the left the sort of influx of new eggs by integrating over the mature fish and see how much energy they're diverting into reproduction and that's given by this formula here okay so that's a little bit about these size spectrum models i've tried to give a sort of overview of uh, most things I, I may put a, a video on the internet to describe the thing in more technical detail if anyone wants to know the technicalities and equations and so forth um, but now i want to talk more about what we're what we're doing with these models and um you know hopefully what we can what we can do to help you with your uh, marine ecosystem modeling so there is a software package called miser and um, that's a size spectrum modeling package and one of the things we've been doing is trying to speed it up and improve it and think about the models and how we can uh, maybe improve upon them and so forth but this has already been used to model some marine ecosystems before so this is an implementation um, for the North Sea and you see we have the different species here uh, cod, haddock, gurnard and so on and we have parameters chosen individually for them um, we can put different types of fishing gears and different fishing rates upon them um, study how the total biomass changes over time and just keep track of how the sort of abundance curves in this system evolve as our PDE runs forwards and that's basically what this MISER package does it allows us to be able to um, simulate these marine ecosystem run these marine ecosystem simulations um, what we're interested in doing is sort of building on that and really getting these systems more ready for um, more widespread um, size spectrum modeling of real marine ecosystems um, in in this in some of these previous implementations um, to say the um, the North Sea the uh, I I think yes the, the, i think there's been other places that the uh, i think south china sea and other places where these models have been used um there's been a sort of problem in fact uh, or at least um we sort of think so at york um that 
they were using the stock recruitment relationship to sort of provide unnatural amounts of stability to the system. In a sense, they weren't really, in at least in my opinion, they weren't really modeling the reproduction properly and they were giving the system a lot of artificial stability because of that. So a lot of our work has been to try and make these kind of microcosms where we have coexisting species and so forth, but to make them in such a way that they are um, they are stable and we can then add other species in and see how they uh, interact with their environment and with one another and to different fishing policies and all of that sort of thing. So we want to make these sort of microcosms and it's a bit of a difficult job because if you don't have um, some sort of like a heavy handed stock recruitment relationship or other if you don't add any other sort of um, direct stabilization mechanisms into the system one sort of feels a bit lost in the parameter space and it's it's sort of clear that there are steady states out there but it's not clear how to sort of make a good um, make a good sort of to find a steady state or a stable system which has parameters near what you'd want to model something in the real world this is a challenge to um, and so one of our sort of um, inspirations is is this sort of Sheldon spectrum, the size of this sort of scale free properties that are um, observed at least approximately in, in marine ecosystems. So what do I mean? Well, <clears throat> this is really quite an interesting idea because it's basically about relating the counts of individuals at different um, at different sizes and it seems as if at least approximately there's there's some sort of power law relationship um which can tell you quite a lot about um what the abundance is of different organisms at different weights i mean if this principle were exactly true i shall explain the principle in a moment but if it was exactly true then you could sort of look at a bucket of water and see how many organisms there were of different sizes in there and use that to infer how many sort of giant squid and blue whales there would be in in the sea um, just by scaling up the type of counting relationships you see so here's the basic idea um, if you look at all the sort of organisms at different sizes um, well put them in bins according to their weights so the organisms with a weight between 1 and 10 go in this first bin the, the second bin holds the organisms between 10 and 100 grams, the third between 100 and 1,000 grams, um, and so on. So we, we organise these organisms into, into the bins according to their weights, and these bins are um, sort of logarithmic size intervals. Now, the interesting observation is that if we sum up the biomass of all of the organisms in a particular bin, we get approximately the same number doesn't matter which bin we do. So there are not many um, organisms in this bin between um, between 10,000 and 100,000 grams. Um, but those organisms are very heavy. And it turns out that the biomass is the same as the biomass, say, in this first bin. The sort of total biomass of organisms with a weight between 1 gram and 10 grams. It's quite a remarkable idea. And this suggests some, well, if one takes this sort of observation and runs with it and says, oh, I think all of these systems have lots of scale free properties and all the rest of it. Um, the maths gets very, very nice and one's able to find a sort of analytic expression for a steady state and describe lots of things about solutions to that McKendrick von Furster equation exactly. And we've tried to use that understanding to make a sort of microcosm idea so these blue curves here these are the abundance curves for different species now these species are very similar to each other they just have they grow to different sizes um, th these species grow to this size here um, and this first species here they only grow to this size here and so the, the different species have different maturity weights different different asymptotic weights and so forth um, but 
apart from that they have very similar parameters. Now we found out how to solve this type of system and what we are sort of proposing is to use this as a sort of background for a marine ecosystem. So we have a model of plankton, we have a model of sort of background species which are somewhere in um, some uh, some species in, in the background of the sea and we have um, some sort of extra death effects coming from perhaps unmodeled individuals from above and um, basically you can then load a new species in here and um, sort of depress this um, abundance of background species at the appropriate weights and put the new one in and um, you've then got a dynamic system with a new species in, like, let's say, a gurnard or a red mullet or something. And so the basic idea here is that we're proposing to take this sort of... Um, and we've, we've done experiments where we take these sort of background systems and then start replacing this background, which is all sort of nicely organised to a power law and so on, replace it with, with uh, other with other um, organisms we're interested in modeling the ecology of. So let's say we wanted to put a gurnard into this. Um, we could say remove one of these species and replace it with a gurnard species. And then we can model how that gurnard's going to eat um, smaller gurnard and other species and how they're going to eat it and how everything's going to change, including the background. And um, because of our sort of analytic results we we have some idea how to set these things up so that they're near to some steady states and ideas about how to sort of um, find stable um, parameter regimes and so on um, so that's the basic idea um, thank you very much for your attention